An evergreen garden looks as good in winter as it does in summer. And taking that all gardens need some maintenance, it's also relatively easy care. I've just been to see a brilliant evergreen garden in Norfolk, which belongs to Roger Lloyd and Stephen Sendall. And there's some very clever ornamental touches that I think are inspiring for any sort of a garden, even if you don't want an evergreen garden. Additionally, it's on a slope, so it's a very interesting look at how you manage gardening on a slope. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog, and I'll put links to any resources and plant names in the description below with timestamps. And if you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, they're free, then tap the subscribe button. And if you'd like YouTube to tell you when a new video is uploaded, then tap the notifications bell. Roger is a volunteer with the Norfolk Gardens Trust, which has garden visits and talks to grand gardens like Sandringham, and it promotes and protects beautiful gardens in Norwich all over, whether they're small or large. So perhaps it's not surprising that a friend of Stephen and Roger's once told them that their garden had all the elements of a grand garden but scaled down to a small garden. In fact, it's what we would call a middle-sized garden because it's about 100 feet long, uh, that's about 30 metres, and about 25 feet wide, that's about 7.5 metres. So it is in many ways a long, thin garden and it's on a slope. Just to give you a quick look at one of these elements of a grand garden, take this classical folly that's halfway up their garden. In fact, it's an absolutely ordinary garden shed and Stephen built the folly as a facade. It literally stands in front of the garden shed. They haven't even changed the garden shed door. And to show you how they conceal the ordinary sides of the garden shed, I'll take you from the bottom of the garden right up to the top. When Roger and Stephen moved into this house 40 years ago, the garden was just a bare space. And faced with a slope, many people terrace a garden, and actually that's a very good way of doing it. But what they decided to do was to carve out a terrace at the bottom by the house and to use the excess earth that that produced to create a flat area at the top of the garden. But they decided to leave the rest of it sloping. Because it's on a hill, it can be windy, so they decided to go for evergreen hedges on either side. But rather than make it look boxy and square, they curve the hedges in so it's like a serpentine path through the garden. And of course it means you can always see that the garden goes on a little bit further, but you can't quite see where to or how big it is. The other thing is that curving a hedge in away from a straight border creates spaces behind the hedges, but they're not wasted spaces. Roger and Stephen use them as practical areas, so that's where the compost bins and the wheelbarrows go. Roger refers to the lawn as a green path rather than a lawn. It curves up sinuously between the hedges and goes right up to the top where there's a bench and a tree and then there's an archway in the yew hedging. Beside the archway there's a niche with a classical urn but it's when you step through the archway that you see the truly amazing thing about this garden which is a wonderful view of Norwich including Norwich Cathedral right at its heart. Roger told me that this gave them some design problems about the garden because it's such a fantastic view that you almost don't want to rival it with bright colours and herbaceous borders. But they did want something that would balance it out. So they decided to go for this low evergreen parterre of box and yew hedging. There are a lot of problems with box in Britain at the moment because of the box tree, moth caterpillar and also because of box blight. But Roger's not had too many problems so far and I've got a video in the description below with three alternatives to box hedging because I think probably if you're starting with box now it's probably better not to. There are also some very interesting tricks up here at the top. If you look at this evergreen hedging they've got these striped columns and that's using a very yellow leafed cypress with a dark green leafed Irish yew and clipping them into shapes. So this is really where I talk about maintenance because people say oh what a lot of clipping that must be a lot of work but of course if you compare clipping evergreens which is once or twice a year or at the very most three times a year with the kind of work that say a herbaceous border is where you're deadheading, you're staking, you're lifting, you're dividing, you're adding annuals, you're filling in gaps Really, the once, twice or three times a year clipping of evergreen hedges is less work. But it's not no work because no garden is no work. So what about the borders in an evergreen garden? Roger says they originally planned to have classic herbaceous borders because he loves them. 
but after two or three years of trying to make a herbaceous border work on a slope, they decided it would be much easier to use evergreen shrubs and to clip some into shapes. So essentially this border is about foliage contrast. You've got the yellow foliage of conifers with a slightly blue rue. You've got Astelia and Formium and Yucca with spiky leaves. And you've got the rounded shapes of a clipped honeysuckle or Lonicera. You've got Box and Yew and Choisia and a number of other plants. I'll put a full plant list in the description below, linked to a timestamp to this part of the video. However, one thing an evergreen garden does need is some punctuation points. In a garden full of flowers, flowers create a lot of the interest. And so even if you've got wonderful foliage contrast and shape, it's still a good idea to have some garden ornaments. And this is where Roger and Stephen's grand touches appear. There's an obelisk as a focal point halfway up the garden, which looks like stone, but Stephen made it out of wood and painted it because Roger says they couldn't afford uh, the real material, the real stone. There's, of course, the classical garden shed. Where a hedge curves in, Roger has added a cherub, and he's cut a niche in the hedging which frames an urn. One of the most interesting things about this garden is a clever use of ivy, and I know some of you really don't like ivy. Ivy is one of our most common evergreen plants, and for many people it is a weed. It is, for example, on the list of noxious weeds for the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So wherever you are, it is worth checking to see if ivy or any particular kind of ivy is strongly recommended against in your area. However, there are lots of different kinds of ivy and they're hugely helpful to wildlife. They help absorb pollutants in the air and it needs very little looking after. For example, Roger and Stephen have used ground cover ivy to cover the ground instead of planting on the north facing side of their border. This means that no weeds will come through. Ivy produces a very dense mat and it prevents weeds from growing. And Roger says that the ground cover ivy doesn't spread as quickly as some of the climbing ivies, so it just needs one trim back a year. They've also grown ivy across the risers of the garden steps, and they said that actually it did take some patience and time to train the ivy in this way, but it does look amazing, and then it curves romantically around the urn. They've also let ivy climb up bench legs and things like that. I particularly liked this ivy-covered wall, and they've planted a trellis in front of the ivy, so you've got a layered effect, and they're going to grow star jasmine up the trellis. So how damaging is ivy? A lot of people believe that allowing ivy to cover buildings and trees, which actually Roger and Stephen haven't done, they have cut it back before it got there, is damaging to the buildings and trees. There has been some research by both English Heritage and the RHS to say it can actually protect buildings, but obviously more research is needed. But if you're interested in ivy, look to see if there are varieties that are not considered a problem in your area, or equally, perhaps look at something else that may be a very common plant where you live and just think about how you could possibly use it in a different kind of way. So what about flowers in an evergreen garden? You do need flowers in every garden because they're so important for pollinators and, and they lift our spirits. In autumn, Stephen and Roger have cyclamen around the obelisk at other times of the year, there are spring bulbs in this part of the grass. And Roger says they're usually bulbs that have been given to them uh, by friends in pots for indoor use. And they just plant them out and obviously some of them take and some of them don't. And they don't mow the grass until the spring bulbs foliage has died down. But otherwise, it's a very easy care way of having flowers. And they do pop so a few flowers like Cosmos in and the borders from time to time. If you're interested in making your garden look better in winter, there's a Winter Gardens playlist at the end of this video. And do let me know if you've got some good evergreen plant tips in the comments below. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.